Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, as we gather together, we begin a new sermon series on the promises of God. Over the next seven weeks, we're going to hear about the promises God has made to us and how these promises give us assurance in our relationship with Him and confidence as we walk forth in the world to live for Him. The challenge is that we face in what, while we're doing this series is that we hear these promises so often that we fail to really plumb the depths of what they mean. For example, what does it mean that God is our strength? What does it actually mean? How do we understand how that applies to our life? We know God is strong. The children know God is strong. But what does it mean that God is our strength? See, it can be confusing if we really don't understand what it means in application to us. And so we're going to explore that theme today, the promise that God has made. I am your strength or I am your refuge and strength, we hear sometimes. What does that mean? Well, in the Bible, there are actually two words that come into the English language as strength. One of them is strength in the sense of power or might. That is the strength God gives us to stand in the midst of the battle. The strength that God gives us to stand our ground when all the world is seemingly against us. And the second word that comes into the English as strength is better understood as our place of refuge and security. Now, in the Middle Ages, when nobles of this ancient lands built castles, they would build a structure in the middle of the castle called a keep, K-E-E-P, a keep. And that was a fortified structure in the middle of the castle that when the battle was going raging wildly, and it seemed as if you were about to be overcome, you could flee or retreat into the keep and be secure and safe because it was an impregnable structure. With a battle raging all around, you needed a place of safety and security, and that was the keep. And what we want to see today is how both these images, both of God's strength for us in the midst of the battle, that we can stand our ground, and that God is our strength, the place we flee for refuge and security and safety, how both are present in our lives because God is present with us. And He's made us the promise that He will be our strength. Now, when the Apostle Paul writes the, the letter to the Ephesians that that Bobby just read. He writes about the armor of God. And I want you to hear again just the first opening section of it. He says, finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by His vast strength. You get it? Be strengthened by His strength. He says it twice. Put on the full armor of God that's able to stand against the tactics of the devil. For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. This is why you're, you must take up the full armor of God so you may be able to resist in the evil day and having prepared everything to take your stand. What exactly is Paul talking about? He's talking about the time's going to come when you are going to be attacked. You're going to be attacked, and God has given you the strength, the ability to stand strong in the midst of those attacks, to stand strong in faith, to stand against what is coming at you to assault you in the world. He speaks of tactics or schemes. These are the lies, the deceptions, the, the misguided information, the, the temptations that come to you the things that assault your faith. He says, put on the armor of God and take your stand. Stand in faith against all the assaults and the attacks that come against you. And then he also says that we need that sense of security that God gives because it's his strength. We see, we see both these things happening in the life of Jesus. Jesus. And we see it more readily in his life than in ours. If we open our eyes, we'll understand because he tells us 
Who are we battling? We don't battle flesh and blood. The people out there, they're just puppets. Who's the real power? He tells us that they are the spiritual forces of wickedness, the darkness, the evil of the world, the power behind the, the power that we see. The devil and who he is and his influence in the world and what he's trying to do and what's his goal, destroy your faith. Drag you into hell with him. That's what he wants to do. It's not that he loves you, not that he wants you. He just hates God. And because God loves you, he wants to destroy you and hurt God's heart. That's all he cares about. Spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places, evil, darkness, these are the real powers that we fight, that we struggle in. And it is because of the reality of who we struggle with in battle that we need God's strength. We see it in the life of Jesus. We see it. After 40 days of fasting, the devil came with his temptations, didn't he? Was it for Jesus just not a big deal to be tempted? Or did he feel temptations? Did he feel them exactly like you do? The answer to that is exactly like you do. The temptations were real. He was hungry. He was hungry. You ever been famished? You're like Esau that sold his birthright for a bowl of stew because he was so famished he just had to have something to eat right now. Forty days with nothing to eat. Here, turn the stones into bread. Jesus, you can do it. Could Jesus have turned the stones into bread? Absolutely. Absolutely. Would it have been a sin to turn stones into bread? The issue is he, wasn't, he would not have been trusting his father. So he stood against the temptations. All the kingdoms of the world. Could Satan have delivered all the kingdoms of the world? Absolutely. They were his to give. Jesus could have reigned as king without the cross if he had chosen to. Could he jump from the pinnacle of the temple and be saved? Yes. There were very real temptations, and yet Jesus stood his ground and said no to every one. But when the time of temptation was over, what happened? Jesus needed a place of refuge, a place of rest, a place of security, and the Father sent the angels to, to attend to him. See, both are seen in his life. His standing strong in the midst of the battle and a time of refuge and comfort to be strengthened and nourished, to have security and peace. We see this repeated in Jesus' life over and over again. And often the battles he faced and the trials that came against him were, were through other people. Some were used as pawns by the forces of evil in the world. But yes, there were those who, who he confronted about sin, and how did he win those victories? By proclaiming forgiveness and life to those who have been trapped in sin. But then there were those who, who would take his words and twist them and turn them and try to use them against him. What did he do? He stood firm and fast on the truth of the word of God and would not compromise. And when the battle drew so close that it drew blood, what did he do? He relied on the strength the Father gave him, found his security in the Father. Do you remember that night in the garden? That night that in agony, knowing what was going to happen, in less than 12 hours, probably, you know, 8 hours, 10 hours away, he'd be scourged, have the hide ripped from his body, he'd be crowned with thorns, he'd be nailed to a cross, he would suffer the judgment of God upon sin, in agony in the garden, knowing that was about to happen, he sweat great drops of blood. Now, a lot of people don't understand that passage. A lot of people get confused. It's even translated inaccurately at times. His sweat became like drops of blood. No. Luke, who wrote that, is a doctor. He understands it. In the enormity of the stress of the moment, the little capillaries under the skin begin to hemorrhage. And blood oozes out with the sweat. And your sweat becomes bloody drops of sweat. It's called hematrodosis. It's a medical condition that is verified in science. Sweating blood under the stress of knowing what is about to happen. What does he say? Father, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I will, but your will be done. 
He trusts in the Father. And what does the Father do? The Father immediately sends angels to strengthen him. To strengthen him. You see, Jesus found his security, his comfort, his confidence in the Father. Now, I want you to understand something. I want you to hear me clearly in this. Jesus did not have to do any of this. He did not have to become weak. He did not have to go to the cross. He did not have to suffer and die. Jesus is God, and he could do anything he wanted to do. He chose, like I was trying to tell the children, he chose that even though he was strong enough to make a different choice, he was strong enough to make the choice to come into this world as a human being. A a mere mortal just like us. And as a human being, he lived his life every moment trusting in his father. He trusted his father for the food he ate. He trusted in his father for the strength he needed to stand in the face of trial and temptation. He trusted his father against the assaults of the devil who time and time again wanted to kill him. Do you understand that your battle is not against flesh and blood? Sometimes it's the people of the world who bring temptations and trials and testings, but behind the veil, if you were to pull the veil back and really see what's going on, all the forces of darkness, what we'd call the hordes of hell, are all around seeking one thing. They want to destroy you. And the only reason they haven't is because God stands with you. The forces that are just as numerous If you could pull back the veil and see the forces of good, the heavenly beings, what we call angels, are there to protect and to guard you against those who would destroy you. So yes, Jesus was, chose to live his life as a mortal human being, trusting in the Father every step of the way. Why? Because he wanted us to understand. He wanted us to understand what it meant to live our lives in this world, trusting in the strength of God. That God would be our strength. Yes, that God would, would give us what we need to stand against trials and temptations and testings that come our way. The deceptions and the lies. But there's a problem. We see what Jesus did, but we have not learned the lesson. We rely on ourselves. We trust in ourselves. We only turn to God in times of crisis. The rest of the time we think we can do it. With all that the world is throwing at us, we think we have it in us to stand our ground on our own. When's the last time, and this is just as much for me as this for you, when's the last time you actually prayed to God and asked Him to strengthen your heart and your mind against the lies and the deceptions of the world? Have you ever prayed that prayer? I hadn't. And yet we are assaulted day after day after day with lies and deceptions and people just blindly accept them as the truth. Where'd you come from? As a human being, where'd you come from? Uh, We descended from monkeys. Really? Really? Take a, 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 you know, little monkey or an orangutan or a gorilla and put them alongside a human being and tell me that a human being came from, from these things. That's nothing but stupidity in a textbook. Are you a, a boy or a girl? I don't know what day of the week is it. Let me see how I feel. And I'll decide and I'll tell you. What's good, what's legal, and what's illegal? Well, that depends on who's in office at any given time and what state you live in. Do you see how ridiculous it is to understand that the lies and the deceptions are coming against us over and over and over again. And we think we can handle all of this ourselves on our own without the strength of God in our lives. One morning, a young father got up and was drinking coffee in the kitchen and his little boy was out in the backyard playing in a sandbox. He was standing there drinking his coffee, looking out the glass window and He sees his son try to pick up this rock. It had been there 
in the sandbox and to sit on and play around and play on. But he wanted it out of a sandbox. The little boy's trying to move this big rock. And he can scoot it a little bit and lift the corner, but it's too big for him to get out of the box. And finally, he just gives up, kicks the dirt. Father, cup in hand, walks out on the back patio and says, Son, have you used all your strength to get that rock out of the sandbox? The boy says, Yes. Father said, No, you haven't. Because if you had asked your father, you would have had all the strength you need to move the rock. See, sometimes we're like that little boy. We think we can do it ourselves when we forget that the strength of the Father is there for us so we are truly strong enough to move the rock or, in this instance, to take our stand against the evil of the world, against all the lies and the deceptions, the schemes and tactics of the devil. All we have to do is ask. Jesus tells us, ask the Father. He says, what man among you, if his son asks for a, ask him for bread, will give him a stone? Or he asks for fish, will give him a snake? God who is good and who loves you, promises to give you what you need. What you need to stand in the midst of the battle. Paul describes it to us. He says, put on the armor of God, but put it on prayerfully. What are the pieces of armor that he talks about? Truth. The truth that God reveals. The belt of truth that girds and holds everything else together. The truth upon which we stand. The breastplate of righteousness, not righteousness of my own, but the righteousness that God gives me in Christ, the righteousness that I can claim through faith that God declared me righteous because of the cross. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, that I stand upon the gospel. That is the foundation, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Not only is it where I stand, but it goes with me as I go forth into the world so others will know it. The shield of faith by which I can quench all the fiery darts of the evil one. The shield of faith, faith that connects me to all the promises of God. Faith that makes me a child of God. That every lie and deception, everything that comes against me is ex extinguished because of faith. The helmet of salvation, the crown of all that is of God, that I live every day with the knowledge and the understanding that I have eternal life and that cannot be taken away from me. And the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, the one offensive weapon, a piece of armor in the whole outfit, the truth of God's Word that declares to the world who He is and what He's done. Every one of these is given to us by God so we can be strengthened, His strength in our lives for the battle, for what we endure as we live in this world not just what comes from the neighbor down the street, but the power and the influence that's motivating the neighbor down the street. Not what comes from the government, but the powers and the forces of evil that are motivating behind the scenes what the devil is trying to do. That's the strength we need. And then there are times. There are times in our life when it becomes too much. When we have stood our ground and we are overwhelmed and we need to flee for refuge, we need the strength of God to protect us when we would otherwise fall. And where do we go? The old castles had a keep. Go inside the keep, the door is shut, and you are secure. Where is it we find that kind of protection and security? It is in our God. Our God who says, I am stronger. Do you understand that if it was not for the one who was stronger than you and the one who was stronger than the forces of evil in this world, you would be destroyed. God is the one we flee to for refuge because he is the one who stands strong to protect us and to give us the security we need, the peace and the comfort of knowing that when things are out of our control, they're never out of God's control. When things are overwhelming, they will not overwhelm God. That He can stand strong for us. Just a little less than a year ago, a man walked into Odessa Regional Hospital. This was October last year, do you remember? And he had a girlfriend who was giving birth in the maternity ward. 
and he went on some kind of rampage and decided he was going to try to kill every infant in the maternity ward. Do you remember that? He actually got his hands on a newborn baby and tried to choke that baby to death. I don't know what goes through the mind of an individual like that or what kind of person it is that would try to kill a helpless infant. And thank God there were other people there in that hospital ward that helped those children and got that man away from the babies and secured the babies away from him until police could get there. A baby is helpless. A baby is defenseless. A baby can do nothing for itself. A baby needs a parent or an adult to do everything for them. Without someone else protecting the baby would die. You need someone stronger than you. You need someone who's going to fight for you because the one coming against you comes against you with assaults that you cannot handle on your own. You're a sinner. That's what the devil says. You've broken your promises to God over and over and over again. You're unworthy. To belong to God. You trust more in yourself than you do God. Time and time again, the devil whispers in our ear of our guilt and our unworthiness. And you know what? Everything he says about us is true. Are you a sinner? Have you failed to keep your promises to God how many times? Have you trusted in yourself more often than you trust in God on a day-to-day basis? The only thing that we are really good at is convincing ourselves that we're good enough. We are guilty, as the devil says. And if it were not for one stronger than the devil coming to our aid, we would be lost. We need help. And so God comes. God comes to us. Jesus came into this world, the one who was holy and innocent. But we were guilty and deserving of death. So what does he do? What does the strong one do as he comes to rescue the helpless? He chooses to become helpless. He chooses to become weak. He chooses to become feeble. The one who's innocent becomes guilty of sin as he's nailed to a cross, and there he suffers. He suffers. God of eternity who is stronger than all, allows himself to suffer so that the guilty might go free. He dies that we might have life. He came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. The one coming against us was stronger than us. And yet Jesus stands today as the one who declares the truth. I want you to hear this. The devil says to you, sin. Jesus declares blood. The devil yells guilty. Jesus declares forgiveness. The devil says you deserve death. Jesus says I've given you life. That's what the cross means. That is the strength of God that we stand in. So when life is overwhelming, When life is more than we can handle, where do we flee? Where is our keep? Where is our place of refuge? We flee to the cross, to the blood that was shed, to the forgiveness that was won, to the grace and love that is freely given. There we find our place of security in our God. And we know that He is our strength, that we stand in Him secure. And in that moment, we will feel the arms of the Father wrap around us and know that we are forever, forever safe and secure with Him. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord until life everlasting depart in peace. Amen.